Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, with me, I have uh, Matt Anderson, AVP of Business Analysis. Uh, Matt has been a key resource for CureMD in, uh, in the past eight years. And through his insightful analysis and quality control, he has ensured that the company stays up to date with industry requirements, certifications, and federal incentives programs. Thanks for joining us, Matt. Thanks a lot, Chris. All right. Um, there will be a question and answer session at the end, so feel free to post all your questions in the question box on your screens. And also, on the left of your screen, we have some resources that uh, we have shared for you to download. Let's begin with today's webinar. Over to you, Matt. All right. Thank you, Chris. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, so we're going to be talking about meaningful use. And uh, in particular, uh, we'll be talking about the recently announced changes to the, uh, to the meaningful use reporting that took place uh, a couple months back. Uh, so we're going to dive into that for the first 10-15 minutes of this webinar, talk a bit about how those changes are going to impact your practice. And after that, we're going to follow it up with a couple of tips that we have for you, uh, some things, six things in particular that you should do before the end of the year uh, if you want to go for meaningful use in 2015. So let's get started. So well, first off, uh, in case you haven't heard, CMS has made some major changes to meaningful use. Uh, in the final rule that was announced on October 6, 2015. Uh, these changes impact the next three years of meaningful use, so from 2015 reporting year, 2016, and 2017. And uh, they're made for both uh, uh, providers who were scheduled to perform meaningful use stage one and stage two in 2015. Uh, overall, the changes, I believe, are good and are going to make it a bit easier for the providers to achieve meaningful use this year as compared to 2014. Uh, so let's dive into this a bit more and, and discuss some of these changes. All right, so uh, we're going to call it modified stage two. Uh, so that's uh, basically, and let's take a look at the, some of the major differences between this and the previous year's uh, reporting requirements, which were for stage one and stage two of meaningful use. So in the previous year, uh, we were scheduled to previously to have a full year of reporting in 2015. In modified stage two, uh, we've got CMS has gone ahead and modified that, and you only need to report 90 continuous days in 2015. So that's a big change, and we'll be discussing that as we go on in this webinar. So again, in the previous stages, we had a complicated framework of core and menu measures. So anyone who's done meaningful use before would know what core and menu measures are. So we've gotten away with that, and now we have 10 simple objectives, which everyone will have to do. Uh, there's no core and menu measure, so it's, come, it's become a lot easier for providers to understand what the requirements are. Uh, the next big point is that a lot of measures uh, that CMS has termed as redundant or duplicative, topped out measures, they've been removed from reporting. So you'll be reporting on less measures this year as compared to 2014. And we'll just, as we go into the next slide, we'll be able to see uh, which of these measures have been removed from meaningful use reporting. Uh, one big complaint that providers had with the 2014 version of meaningful use was the high performance threshold for patient engagement measures. So meaningful use stage two, it changed a lot of things when it came to patient engagement. And a lot of providers found it a bit tough to achieve those measures. Well, CMS did hear your call, and the performance thresholds for these patient engagement measures has been reduced. So these are the four major differences between stage two and the modified stage two of 2015. So we have a 90-day reporting period. We have 10 objectives, no more core or menu measures. Uh, we've eliminated some measures, and we've reduced the performance thresholds. So overall, it's good news. OK, so here's what stage one and stage two look like in 2014. So those providers who uh, did a test to meaningful use in 2014 should be quite familiar with these measures and what this slide basically represents. So if we look at stage one over here, so we had 13 core measures. And in the menu section, we had nine measures, out of which you had to report on five of them. In stage two, we had 17 core measures and six menu measures, out of which you had to report on three of them. 
So these were the measures as of last year. So the first thing I want to talk about is that uh, CMS has done away with a lot of these measures. So if I go to my next slide over here, you'll be able to see that a lot of these measures, a lot of these measures have been uh, stricken out. Uh, and let's talk about some of them here. So if you were planning to do stage one in 2015, you no longer need to report on the problem list measure, the medication list measure, the allergy list, recording demographics, vital signs, smoking status, clinical summaries, uh, drug formulary, clinical lab test results, patient lists, patient reminders, and the transition of care summary. So these measures, and all in all, so we had 23 measures in stage one. As you can see, uh, 12 of them have been removed. Uh, the reasoning behind this is that uh, CMS now believes that the Meaningful Use Program and uh, health IT in general in the U.S. has evolved uh, since Meaningful Use started in 2011, and these provider, these measures, uh, they no longer need reporting from providers on these. Uh, basically, from all the providers, and if you look at the stats of these measures, everyone was achieving above 90% in these measures. And uh, just to make the program a bit simpler, uh, you don't no longer need to report these measures when it comes to meaningful use. That doesn't mean you shouldn't document them. Apparently, CMS does believe that uh, uh, they're sort of become an inherent part of the provider workflow that uh, even though reporting is no longer required, uh, providers will continue to do this just to make sure everything's working fine. If we look at stage two, you'll see a bit of the same, all the same measures that we covered in stage one. Uh, they've been removed. And in addition, the three menu measures here, electronic notes, imaging results, and family health history. So if you were uh, attesting in 2015 and one of these measures was giving you some trouble, uh, you don't need to worry about that anymore as you won't be reporting on those in 2015. So that's the first thing. A lot of measures have been reduced. The second thing uh, is about reduced thresholds, which we're going to talk about as well uh, as we move on. So once we remove all of these measures, uh, here's what the modified meaningful use looks like. And it's going to be in, in here since for, uh, from 2015 all the way up to 2000. 17. So let's take a look at some of these measures. So just to reiterate, we've only removed measures. None of the measures that were here, so all of these that were left, they're all here in modified stage two, and nothing has changed. So basically, we had 23 measures in stage one, 12 of them or 11 of them were stricken out, and the ones that are remaining basically have been reorganized into this modified meaningful use stage two. Similarly for stage two, all the remaining measures have been reorganized, as I mentioned, into these particular 10 objectives that we're going to cover in these next two slides. OK, so here's uh, what Modified Meaningful Use Stage 2 looks like for 2015. So the first objective is about protecting patient health information. So we've had this since the beginning of Meaningful Use. Uh, it's just basically about protecting the um, patient health information that's stored inside your EHR and taking appropriate guidelines to do that. And we'll talk about this measure as we go a bit deeper into, into this webinar. The second objective is on clinical decision support. So it has two parts. The first part is that you need to implement clinical decision support rules. And the second part is that you need to enable drug-to-drug -drug and drug-to-allergy interactions into your EHR. And this measure was there in stage one, as well as stage two in 2014. So no change here. Objective three is related to computerized provider order entry. So this has three parts. Medication orders, they need to be created using CPOE. Lab orders need to be created using CPOE. And radiology orders need to be created using CPOE. For a stage two provider, you need to do all three. But for the stage one provider, you only need to do the first one. So if you're doing stage one, all you need to worry about is the first measure. Next objective is electronic prescribing. So again, this is pretty much unchanged and was part of stage one as well as stage two in 2014. Fifth measure is health information exchange. So this one wasn't in stage one, but was in stage two. So because of that, since it wasn't there in stage one, you are eligible for an exclusion if you were scheduled for stage one in 2015, which is why we have this little marking here to explain that you can easily apply for an exclusion just on the basis that you were scheduled to do stage one in 2015. And at this time, I think I, maybe I should explain what who is eligible to do stage one uh, in 2015. So those providers who are testing for the first time, 
to meaningful use or are in their second year, they can go ahead and attest for stage one. Uh, if you're in your third year, then you need to do stage two. So this measure, it basically relates to uh, the patients that you refer to other providers who transition from your care to another provider. Uh, you need to send electronically send a summary of care record for these providers. So this is a tricky measure for stage two, uh, but for stage one providers, you'll get an exclusion. Okay, moving on. Sixth objective is related to patient education. So this was there in stage one as well as stage two, but since it was an optional, a menu measure in stage one, uh, you can apply it to an exclusion just on those grounds that you were scheduled to do stage one in 2015 and because it was an optional measure and you weren't planning on doing this, you can take an exclusion. If you were scheduled for stage two, you'll need to go ahead and do this measure. It's pretty simple. You just need to provide patient education to 10% of your patients. Seventh objective is medication reconciliation. So same story. It was part of stage one and stage two, but for stage one, part of the menu set so you can apply for an exclusion on the basis of that. Stage two, you would need to go ahead and do this measure. And basically for any provider that's transitioned into your care, so all your incoming referrals, those patients you need to perform medication reconciliation. The eighth objective is on patient electronic access. So this has two parts. So you need to first of all provide your patients with timely access to view, online, download, and transmit their health information. So basically providing access to a patient portal from your EHR so that they can log in and view their data. That's the first part. The second part is that the patient actually logs in and views that health information. So for a stage one provider, since the second part, which would be this, was not required previously, uh, you would not need to do this measure but you would need to do the first part. For stage two, you would need to do both parts. But there's some good news for stage two providers. So the threshold for this particular measure previously was 5%. So 5% of the patients that you saw during the reporting period, they actually had to log in to the patient portal account or whatever way you chose to provide them access to their health information and actually view that information. Now the threshold has been reduced from 5% to just one patient. So if one patient, that you saw in your in the in your reporting period logs in and views the health their health information you're good to go with this measure so become a very welcome change for stage two providers because I know a lot of providers personally who found it very tough to perform this measure in 2014 next one secure messaging so this is another one which was part of stage two but was not part of stage one. So because of that, you'll get an exclusion if you are a stage one doc. If you're a stage two doc, uh, there is good news, just like the previous uh, measure. Previously, uh, in this measure, let me just explain what it is basically. So 5% of your patients were required, uh, those who have capability to send and receive, those pro patients who have an access to your patient portal or some other tool which would provide them access to the ability to securely message their providers. So out of the patients that you saw in the reporting period, the threshold was that 5% of them would need to uh, go ahead and message their providers in order to make you uh, achieve this measure. So some major patient engagement was required uh, in this measure and a lot of providers found it tough in 2014. So the threshold has been reduced from 5%. And uh, for this year, you just need to have uh, just the functionality in your system. So that's pretty much anyone with a certified EHR will be able to just achieve this measure on the basis of that. Uh, from 2016 onwards, it would be one patient, so just like the previous measure. But for now, so it was 5%, but you now just need to have the functionality in place. Okay, moving on. The tenth objective, which is related to public health reporting, so there are two parts to that particular uh, measure. The first one is related to immunization data, so you need to submit data to your immunization registry, and the second part is related to syndrome surveillance, surveillance, and you need to submit that data to a public health agency. So you have two options here. Anyone who is doing stage one just needs to do one of these. So let me just uh, recap what we just discussed. So these are the 10 new objectives for meaningful use. They're made up of the same measures that we had previously. Uh, we've just removed some measures and reorganized it a little bit and reduced the threshold. 
So overall, good news for everybody. Uh, of the 10 measures that they're there, if you're one of those docs who's scheduled to do stage one, so anyone who's in their first year of meaningful use or their second year, you can claim a bunch of exclusions to make these 10 objectives a lot easier. So you can uh, straight away cross out objective five, six, seven, and nine, so that's four out. And for objective three, you just need to do the first part. For objective A, just the first one, and in objective 10, you have a choice between the two. So um, just basically focus on those measures and not make this any harder than it has to be. For anyone with stage two, you would need to complete all 10 objectives. All right, so let's move on. So a little bit about the attestation periods. So uh, pretty much everyone has to do 90 days this year, and everyone will be doing a full year of reporting in 2016. In, two, in 2017, you would have a choice to do either stage three or the same modified stage two that we're discussing today. But however, by 2018, everyone would have shifted to a stage three reporting. So not much to discuss on this particular slide. So what's your plan for meaningful use of test station? So as I just mentioned, the um, final rule, it came a bit late in the first week of October. Uh, so what should your game plan be? How should you prepare for meaningful use to make sure that you've got all the bases covered for 2015? And that's what we're going to talk about in the rest of this webinar. So we're going to be telling you six things that your practice must cover before the end of the year. So six helpful tips that we've had uh, based on our experience here at QRMD and uh, some things that you should be looking at uh, in the days that are left for this particular uh, reporting period. Okay, so the first thing, it's pretty simple. You just need to make sure you choose the right reporting period. So instead of a full year, we just need to do a 90-day reporting period in 2015, regardless of what stage or year you were in meaningful use. Everyone does 90 days, and it's pretty simple. Uh, and I mean, it's a very welcome change. So we've already had to deal with a lot in 2015 with ICD-10 and everything, and obviously CMS has been considerate with that and has heard the provider's call and basically reduced the reporting period to just 90 days on that thing. So just choose, go through your reports in your EHR and uh, make sure that um, uh, there, uh, and find basically the appropriate 90-day reporting period where you are able to achieve all the meaningful use measures. So that's the first step before we can start the uh, path to attestation. The second thing uh, we want to talk about is performing a security risk analysis. So let me explain what this is. So we just talked about a few slides ago the first objective of the modified meaningful use stage two, which is protecting your patient health information. So the deliverable basically for that particular measure, and I'm sure everyone who's done meaningful use in the last couple of years would know this, is that you need to perform a security risk analysis of your practice. So um, you go through a, a checklist that CMS has provided and you are able to basically identify any security deficiencies that you have in your practice and basically take corrective measure on them. So you just need to make sure you conduct the security analysis before the end of the reporting period. Uh, once you're done, then you will be able to attest uh, to this measure in meaningful use and claim that you've done the analysis. The main importance of doing the security risk analysis is that a document, uh, this document could be required in case there is an MU audit, so you would be advised to perform the security risk analysis and then go ahead and keep a copy of this uh, in case of an MU audit. Uh, let me show you what I mean. So we have a template here at QRMD, it's pretty simple. So this is what a security risk analysis looks like. It just has a couple of questions, some pretty simple stuff. So who in my office has an access to EMR? Do all employees have access to the same EMR rights? How will I know that electronic information has been disclosed? So just fill this out to see if you meet all the uh, requirements uh, that CMS has for protecting patient health information in your practice. And basically just fill this out, sign it up, and then just keep a copy on file so that in case there's an audit, you'll be able to prove that you were able to meet that back when you were reporting. So if you need any help with this or need a copy of this template, uh, we'll be happy to provide you with one uh, here at CareMD. So just uh, uh, work on that. So that's the second task you need to do. The third thing I want to talk about is uh, reading the exclusions. So a lot of these objectives, so these are 10 objectives, and sure, uh, we talked about some of these, but uh, it's very important to know exactly what measures uh, you are eligible for exclusions for. 
Uh, I mean, meaningful use is hard as it is. So if there are some uh, ways of making it easier, some measures that you can get exclusions on based on whatever grounds, uh, you should definitely know about that and apply for those immediately. So let's talk about these exclusions. So the first objective, protecting patient health information, which we just discussed, where you just need to do a security risk analysis of your practice. Uh, there's no exclusion for that. The second objective, clinical decision support. So uh, as I mentioned, it has two parts. One is related to clinical decision support, and the second one related to drug interactions. Uh, so for the drug interactions part, if you are an EP who writes fewer than 100 prescriptions or medication orders during the EHR reporting period, you get an exclusion to that particular measure. And a helpful tip for those providers who are scheduled to do stage one in 2015, you can use the alternate measure, uh, which was there in 2014 stage one of implementing just one clinical decision support as opposed to the five that are required for stage two providers. So you're able to do a reduced threshold measure, measure on the basis of being a stage one provider. Objective three related to computerized provider order entry. So there are three measures. The first one on medication orders, so anyone who writes less than 100 medication orders during the reporting period, you get an exclusion. Similarly, the second and third related to lab and radiology orders. If you do less than 100 orders on any of those measures, then you can claim an exclusion. Um, for stage one providers, uh, not only can you claim an exclusion, but you can also attest to a reduced threshold of 30% for the first measure as opposed to the 60% which is required for stage two providers. And good news for stage one doctors that for measures two and three, the lab and radiology CPO, you don't need to do that as it was not a part of stage one in 2014. The fourth objective is on electronic prescription. So anyone who writes fewer than 100 prescriptions, they can get an exclusion. And for stage one providers, they still have a reduced threshold of 40% as opposed to the 50% for stage two docs. Objective five, so health information exchange. Uh, stage one providers, as I mentioned before, they don't need to worry about this as we do not have an equivalent core measure in stage one 2014. 14, so you can just cross this out, you'll get an exclusion. If you are a stage two provider, you can claim an exclusion if you have a fewer than 100 outgoing referrals or transitions of care. So if you don't refer many patients, you might be eligible for an exclusion to objective five. Objective six for patient education. So any EP who has no office visits during the EHR reporting period, I don't think there would be many, uh, they can claim an exclusion. Uh, as far as stage one docs are concerned, again, they can get an exclusion just because this was part of the menu set of, st of stage one 2014. So there was no equivalent core measure, so you can claim an exclusion for this. Objective seven on medication reconciliation. Again, stage one providers get an exclusion because there was no equivalent core measure. Stage two providers would need to do this measure, but they can claim an, ex claim an exclusion if you're not the recipient of any incoming referral or transition of care during the EHR reporting period. So if no patients are referred to you in the entire reporting period, you can claim an exclusion. Uh, objective eight, patient electronic access. So the first part was that you need to provide your patients access to their health information. And the second part was that those patients actually need to log in and view that information. So stage one providers, they get an exclusion for the second part. Uh, if you want an exclusion to the whole measure and, and you're in stage one or stage two, there are a couple of scenarios where you would get one. Uh, if you don't um, store any order or create any information that's listed, such as the, if you basically uh, don't record the patient's allergies, medications, all the things that are required to be shared with the patient, then you can get exclusion. As I said, not many would be eligible for that. And uh, if you conduct 50% uh, or more of your patient encounters in a county that does not have 50% or more housing units with 4 megabit per second broadband. So if there's a lack of broadband in your area, then you could be eligible for an exclusion uh, to this patient engagement measure. Objective 9, secure messaging. So same requirements for an exclusion. Uh, if you're in an area with low broadband connectivity, you can get an exclusion. Uh, otherwise, stage one EPs, they do get an exclusion since there was no equivalent core measure. Objective 10, so public health reporting. Uh, so public health reporting 
testing, as I mentioned, it has two ops, two measures. One is immunization registry reporting, where you basically uh, report all the immunizations that you perform to the state registry. And the second is syndrome surveillance reporting, where you report that information to a public health agency. Uh, so there are a variety of exclusions for each of these measures. Uh, so for immunization, let's go with those first. So if you don't administration of any immunizations during the EHR reporting period, you can get an exclusion. If you operate in a jurisdiction where no immunization registry is capable of accepting uh, such information, you get an exclusion. And there are still a few states out there who are unable to receive this information. So in those two scenarios, you will get an exclusion for the immunization measure. For the syndrome surveillance reporting um, measure, again, there are a couple of scenarios where you could get an exclusion. So if you're in a category of providers from which ambulatory syndromic surveillance data is collected, um, is not collected, basically, you can get an exclusion. And if you operate in a jurisdiction for which no public health agency is capable of receiving said information, and again, there are still plenty of areas where that is the case, so you might be eligible for an easy exclusion. If you want to find out any of this information, you're not sure, you need some help, you can call us and we'll be happy to uh, help you out. So those are some cases where you can get an exclusion for uh, objective number 10 as far as the alternate exclusions are concerned here. So the stage 1 EPs that just need to do one of these measures, so you, if you're uh, scheduled for stage 1 in 2015, you can do either immunization or the syndrome surveillance. If you're scheduled for stage 2, you only need to do the first measure, which is immunization. You won't have to do the second one because you'll be able to claim an exclusion since it was part of the menu set and it did not have an equivalent court measure in 2014 stage 2. So just to reiterate, uh, stage 1 you have a choice. You can either do immunization or syndrome. For stage 2 you would have to do immunization no matter what, whereas syndrome uh, is just an option. Okay, so these were all of the different exclusions that are available and I know it's uh, a lot of information, uh, but as I said before, this is a very important tip and you need to make sure that you claim an exclusion where you are eligible so that you don't make meaningful use any harder uh, than it has to be. Okay, so task number four that we have for you is contact your public health agency. So this is again related to objective 10 that we were just discussing, which is related to public health reporting where you need to report data to your immunization registry or syndrome surveillance data to your public health agency. So what do you need to do in this case? For immunization registry, it's pretty simple. You need to make sure or you have an interface between your EHR and your state registry. Uh, that's what's required to meet this measure. If you do not have an interface at this time, please contact your vendor and they should be happy to help you out. The second requirement is related to syndrome surveillance. So this is a pretty simple. You don't really need an interface or anything. You just need to uh, extract this data from your EHR and all of them do have this report. And once you've extracted the XML file, the data, you'll be able to, you just need to identify a public health agency near you, which requires this data, and submit this report to them. So these are the two options. And as I mentioned before, stage one has a choice. They can pick any of these. For stage two providers, uh, those who are scheduled to do stage two in 2015, you just need to do the immunization one. You don't have a choice on that. And if you want, you can report the syndrome surveillance data as well, but that's an option. All right. Task number five, a very important one. Since we're seeing a lot of audits these days, uh, we just want to give you a tip here that you maintain all the, uh, all the relevant data on file. So in case there's an audit that you have all of this data and inform information that supports your attestation available to you. And I recommend keeping a screenshot or a printout of your meaningful use performance measures or your KPIs a screenshot or a printout of your clinical quality measures report. You need to maintain that. So this is basically what you're basing your attestation on. The security risk analysis document that we mentioned, uh, you should keep a copy of that on file. Uh, if you're in the process of registering or enrolling with a public health agency or an immunization registry, and uh, let's say there's a delay in that registration or enrollment, and due to which you're unable to have the interface up and running before the end of the reporting period, keep that on file. You'll still be able to attest to the measure. And if you're a Medicaid provider, you need to make sure you keep your Medicaid patient volume report on file. So these are five very important things uh, that you need to keep with you and maintain this on file in case there's an audit. You'll be requested to submit these documents uh, to the auditors. 
And uh, during this time, let's take this time to talk a little bit about pre and post payment audits. So let me explain what a prepayment audit is and what a post payment audit is. So a prepayment audit is that where you, when you go ahead and you attest to meaningful use, and before you're paid, you're randomly selected for an audit, and uh, only once you've cleared your audit and satisfied the auditor's requirements do you get your incentive. A post-payment audit is where you attest for meaningful use, you get paid, but then after a while you're randomly selected for an audit, and only if you're able to clear the audit do you get to keep your incentive, otherwise you would need to return it. So these audits, they began a couple years back, and uh, CMS through its contractor will be conducting these audits during the course. And the most important point here to discuss is that the audit could happen any time within a period of six years. So CMS does recommend that you keep all of your audit documents on file for the next six years. So in case there's an audit, that you would be able to prove and support the attestation that you performed. All right. Uh, the sixth and final tip that we have here is related to hardship exceptions. So um, you might be eligible actually for a hardship exception, so and there are a variety of reasons which we're just going to cover in a couple minutes here, uh, due to which you will be eligible for a hardship exemption. And if you are, then you won't be uh, subject to the payment adjustment uh, or the penalty that comes along with not complying with meaningful use. Uh, so let's go ahead and find out if, if um, and just explain what the requirements are for this hardship exception. Okay, so there are six categories where if you fall into any of these categories, you're eligible for a hardship exception and you'll be able to file with CMS uh, your hardship exception application and you won't be subject to the meaningful use payment adjustment and you won't really need to uh, achieve meaningful use then. So the first one is based on infrastructure. So if you are practicing in an area without sufficient internet access, then you will be eligible for a hardship exception and you won't need to perform meaningful use and you won't get any penalty. If you're a new eligible professional, so if you just started practicing, uh, then for two years you have an exemption for meaningful use. Unforeseen circumstances, so if there was a natural disaster or other unforeseen, uh, anything like that happened in your area or due to which it hampered your practice, you might be eligible for a hardship exception. A patient interaction, so if there's a lack of patient interaction due to whatever reason, uh, you can get a hardship exception. If you're practicing at multiple locations and you're practicing at those locations and more than 50% of your encounters are in an area where you don't have certified EHR technology and you don't have any control over that, you might be able to prove a hardship exception and get one in that case. And there are certain specialties, if they're listed as your primary specialty, in the PICO system six months prior to the first day of the payment adjustment, you would be able to get an exception. And those specialties are anesthesiology, radiology, and pathology. So those three providers, they don't need to do meaningful use. So these are the six categories in which a hardship exception uh, falls into. And uh, to get one, you would need to uh, complete a hardship exception application with the proof and submit that to CMS. And once you submit that and it gets approved, it's valid for one payment year only. The next year, if you're still eligible for an exception, you would need to file again. So CMS has not yet announced the date for when uh, they'll open, but it's probably sometime in the second quarter of 2016 that you would be able to file for a hardship exception for not achieving meaningful use in 2015. So if you fall into any of these categories, don't forget to do that. All right, and that's pretty much it. We just have one last bonus point here that we just added, which is to just to make sure that your NIPS logins are working and you're able to log in right now. If you need any help resetting a password, you can call the number on screen. Uh, just make sure you're able to view your registration information. Everything is accurate. Uh, and just be ready for attesting to meaningful use when uh, the attestation opens on January 4th. So apart from this, QRMD has a lot of meaningful use resources. Uh, you can view our wiki. You can go through our dashboards uh, to see how you're doing with meaningful use. So just use all these resources, and we have a consultation team available as well. So if you need any help achieving meaningful use, just feel free to give us a call. All right. So with that, uh, we're going to start our Q&A session, and I'm just going to hand it over to Chris. And I think a lot of questions have already come in from providers. 
and we can start taking them. And if you haven't put in your question yet, so just open the chat window on the right side of your screen and you should be able to uh, send us a question. Thank you for sharing these useful tips with us, Matt. Uh, we will now open the floor for questions. And the very first question that we have is, uh, when do we need to file for hardship exemptions? So as I mentioned uh, just a few slides ago, Chris, uh, CMS hasn't announced a date, but it's going to be sometime in the second quarter. And I just want to reiterate that you will need to file for it. So just because you fall into one of these categories, don't think that you're going to automatically be exempted from it. CMS does not know about that. Uh, it's going to be sometime in the second quarter of 2016. Just keep an eye out on that and uh, just make sure that you apply. The revised measure states that patients should have the capability to measure, uh, sorry, to message providers through a portal. Do I, as a provider, still need to ask my patients to send me messages? Okay, so I think uh, this is related to the secure messaging measure. So basically, um, for the secure messaging measure, as I mentioned before, it was the requirement was 5%, that 5% of your patients had to message previously. But now you just need to have the capabilities. So that's what this question is related to. Uh, so you don't need to ask your patients anymore to send you messages. You might have had to do that in 2014, uh, but now you don't. You just need to make sure that you provide the patient's capability to message you. So you would need to uh, have your patient portal in place and make sure that at least one of your patients has the access, has an account set up so that they could message you if required. So if you provide the capability to your patients, that's good enough for meeting this measure. Okay, Matt, the next question we have is, in order to send out going re referrals, I tried calling a couple of providers to ask for their direct address, but they have no clue about it. So how am I supposed to send the referral in such a scenario. Okay, so this is uh, this has to do with Objective Five, which is uh, Health Information Exchange. That measure, where if you have uh, if you're sending your patients, if you have outgoing referrals that you send a summary of care document electronically, or you direct message that to the provider that you're referring the patient to. So if you're having uh, a hard time. Uh, so if you're having a hard time meeting that measure, and I've heard a few providers, it's a tricky measure, uh, but um, there's really no way around it. CMS basically tells us that the threshold is pretty low, it's only 10%. So if you were to try uh, and you know contact each of these doctors and try to electronically send a message, you should be able to achieve this for 10%. So um, uh, basically, I guess if you're unable to get the direct address of the provider, then just move on to the next one. and. Um, uh, basically, you just need to send it for 10%, so that's why um, uh, I guess uh, you just need to keep trying. <laughs> Do you have to purchase a patient portal in order to meet the patient electronic access to meet meaningful use? Right. So, uh, well, a patient portal, if you don't have one, you would need to get it. So you can contact us, uh, you contact your MD regarding that. Uh, it is required to meet objectives eight and nine, so related to patient engagement. So patient engagement is a core part of meaningful use, and a patient portal is required for that. For objectives eight and nine, must the portal be active for a full 12 months in 2015 to obtain meaningful use? So uh, that's a valid question, but since the um, reporting period is now 90 days, so for the 90 days that uh, uh, you are choosing as your reporting period, you just need to have the portal active for those 90 days and not for the full year. If I fail the 2014 Meaningful Use Audit, should I attest for the 2015 Meaningful Use EHR Incentive Program? Well, uh, this would depend on why you failed the audit, but in most cases I would say that even if you fail it, you can go ahead and uh, uh, basically a test for this year. Just try to find out what you did wrong the last time and not do that again. 
How can I get a copy of your template for the security risk analysis? So as I mentioned, you just need to contact um, uh, QRMD, just put in a support ticket for it, or uh, uh, send us an email, and uh, we can get you a copy of this. Is a copy of the representation available? Oh, sorry, presentation available? And yes, it is. Uh, we will be sending out a copy to everybody. Uh, the next question is then, we are stage two, but as a chiropractor, do not provide immunizations. How do we handle the required public health reporting measure if we have nothing to report? Okay, so that's a very valid question, and we have, a, I think we are seeing a few questions on, on those lines that if we don't administer immunizations, what do we do? So as we were going through this, I talked about exclusions. So if you don't administer any immunization in your reporting period, reporting period, then you can claim an exclusion for the immunization measure and as a result automatically achieve objective 10. So if you don't do immunizations, that's pretty good. You just claim an exclusion. What if one already attested for stage one meaningful use for Medicaid, should they stick with the Medicaid instead of switching to Medicare meaningful use and how should they decide? Okay, uh, so if um, you did um, Medicaid previously and if you can still meet the patient volume requirements of Medicaid, I would go with Medicaid because it's paying more money at the moment. Uh, if uh, you're unable to meet the Medicaid requirements, then you have no choice but to switch to Medicare. So it's basically, uh, if you can do Medicaid, then do Medicaid. Able to see how the providers are doing on the CQMs. Should our vendor create a report or is post claims data? So uh, there should definitely be a report. There is one in every certified uh, EHR. Uh, so you should be able to uh, see in your in, in uh, QRMD if you go into reports. There's a clinical quality perf clinical quality performance report, uh, which you which you can use to view CQM progress, and uh, it's available from within QRMD. And uh, you have, we have a meaningful use performance report as well and a meaningful use KPI, which basically tells us about the other measures. So run these reports. They are available. We have a lot of material on our wiki as well, which you can access to find out how to basically run these reports and get the latest on your meaningful use performance. We attested in 2013 and 2014, but for 2015, we will not have the patient portal active for 90 days. What do we do then? All right, so uh, no good news uh, as far as that is concerned. You do need to have the patient portal active for 90 days, and if you didn't, uh, it might be too late to meet meaningful use, but uh, uh, the requirements are pretty clear, so you do need to make sure you have the patient portal for, a period of, uh, for your reporting period. A lot of, I see a lot of people asking uh, questions about the slides, if they will be available. Uh, yes, uh, the slides will be available to you guys. We will be emailing them to everybody. Okay, the next question we have is, uh, if we have a documentation that we are working on an interface for immunization uh, interface, but don't actually have one, we still uh, will we still be able to qualify for successful attestation and claim an exemption? Okay, so a great question. So if uh, you do have documentation, as I mentioned, uh, that you are working on an interface, but for some reason or some delay at the immunization interface uh, on the immunization registries part, or for whatever reason you weren't able to get the interface in place, but you have solid documentation that proves that you're working towards it you can still get an exclusion and meet meaningful use. So that's OK. So if you do have that documentation in place, just keep it on file. They might ask for it in an audit. Uh, but uh, if you're in the process of uh, getting the interface in place, you can still get an exclusion and achieve meaningful use. If we haven't purchased the meaningful use portion for 2015, um, does that mean we are going to be penalized for 2015?
Okay. So, uh, of, so I mean, if, if let me just go through the question again. So, if we haven't purchased the meaningful use portion for 2015, so if you're referring to the QRMD uh, meaningful use consulting, so of course, I mean, that's just a consultation service. Uh, you don't need to purchase it. However, you do need to achieve meaningful use in 2015. So, uh, if you don't achieve meaningful use, then you get penalized. So, I mean, uh, strange question, but. Uh, basically, you don't need to uh, purchase anything. You just need to meet meaningful use. How can I get my direct address? Does QRMD assign it? Uh, correct. So you just need to contact us and let us know you're interested in getting a direct address, and uh, we'll be happy to help you out with that. Are there any statistic on percentage of uh, providers who apply for meaningful use dollars uh, but fail to get them? And uh, second part of my question, is there a place in the reference provider section in QRMD to enter in the provider's uh, direct address so we can send electronically from within QRMD? All right, so the first part of the question, which is related to the statistics on how many providers actually uh, fail uh, meaningful use or fail the audits, etc. cetera, uh, well, I don't really have any statistics on that at the moment, uh, Chris, but I do know that uh, based on a recent report that between 55 and 60 percent of the providers in the U.S. have met meaningful use. So. Uh, a percentage of the remaining 40% would be those who failed. So over 50% uh, providers at the moment have achieved meaningful use. The second part of the question, is there a place in the reference provider section of QRMD to enter in the provider's direct address? Uh, well, there isn't at the moment, but we're working on adding that in there. Uh, but in the meanwhile, uh, we do have a search option. So if you're actually sending a, a direct message, you do have an option to search through a directory of about 100,000 providers where you can search by name, address, phone number, etc., and find that provider and their particular direct address. So we do have a big directory you can search from. Uh, but the other thing we're also working on, which is to add a direct address into uh, the referring provider section. All right, before we uh, end the webinar, we've got our last question. Uh, back to electronic referral. The providers need a trust email address. They don't know how to get one. Is there a specific agency that provides this? So uh, you're correct. They do need a direct address from Direct Trust, and they just need to contact their EHR to get one. So all certified EHRs have this capability, and they should be able to provide you with a direct address. So just contact your vendor, and they'll get the address for you. All right. Thank you very much, Matt, for this uh, presentation and uh, answering all of our questions. Uh, thanks a lot, Chris, and thanks for having me here. And I hope everyone uh, enjoyed the webinar and uh, found this information uh, helpful. We have some helpful information on the screen, how you can get in touch with our MU experts uh, if you need any help with your meaningful use. Thank you so much for joining us today. Please remember that we will be emailing over the slides and the recording of the session to everybody soon. If you have been unable to download the handouts, uh, don't worry. We will be emailing everything to you. And uh, we hope you found this uh, webinar very informative. We wish you very happy holidays. And thank you again for joining another webinar from QRMD. Bye-bye.